Ms. Snow, Ms. Snow, aye. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, no. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Lieberman, aye.
Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. No. Colorado. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Aye. Mrs. Hutchison. Mrs. Hutchison. No. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, no. On this vote, the yeas are 51, the nays are 47, three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn not having voted in the affirmative. The motion is not agreed to. Mr. Mr. President. The senior senator from Missouri is recognized. Mr. President, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business. Not objection, so ordered. Mr. President, you know, we just had a vote. Now, imagine for a minute you had a government that was spending too much money. And imagine for a minute that we needed to spend less money. We needed to change our tax code to a tax code that was fair, simpler, didn't pick winners and losers. Imagine for a minute that this was a crisis, and imagine for a minute that this crisis was being wielded by a, like a political two-by-four by the majority of the Republicans that serve in the Senate, this debt crisis. Then imagine for a minute that you had the most profitable corporations in the history of the planet, and they were booking $30 billion in profit every quarter. Over $130 billion in profit year after year. It didn't matter whether the economy was bad, good, or different. Amazing profits. And then imagine for a minute that this government that doesn't have enough money, that a debt that is the political talking point, of my friends across the aisle, imagine if you try to do something simple like say, you know, maybe we shouldn't be spending money on the most profitable corporations in the world. That's what this vote just was. How seriously can we take anybody that talks about debt reduction if they're not willing to pluck the low-hanging fruit of subsidies to a group of folks that, frankly, in Missouri, I guarantee you most people I represent would say they are the least deserving of extra help from the federal government right now. So if you really think about it, what we're doing is we're borrowing money to prop up 
to the tune of billions of dollars a year, already wildly profitable corporations that don't have to pay us royalties because they get to deduct the royalties they pay other countries? Now, I mean, really, seriously, if this was a fairy tale that I was, was reading to my grandson, if I was reading this fairy tale to, to Ian or Levi or Isaac, they would say, well, th this obviously is fiction because this couldn't be true, but it is. That is what, Mr. President, I call the definition of a special interest. That oil is so special around here, wields so much power and so much money that it turns all the talk about debt reduction into empty rhetoric. Last year, the five companies spent $38 billion boosting their share prices just through stock buybacks. $38 billion in just stock buybacks last year. In other words, the five largest oil companies spent in a single year on stock buybacks alone what they are claiming they need in taxpayer-funded subsidies over the next 10 years. According to ExxonMobil's quarterly filings, every time the price of oil goes up by a dollar, they bring in $350 million in annual profit. These companies don't need these subsidies. Now, in, you know, I hear people say, well, you know, if you don't give them the subsidies, which, by the way, is chicken feed to them, what, six billion, eight billion a year is nothing if you're banking 30 billion in profits a quarter. I've heard people say, well, you know, if we don't give them this extra help, then they're going to quit exploring for oil. And the, pa the price of gas will go up. You know, that's just so dumb. They've had these subsidies for what, 30, 40, 50 years? And I think most Americans realize the price of oil has gone up just fine during that time. We're paying plenty at the gas pump right now, and they've got those subsidies. How's that working out for us? Those subsidies are really keeping down the price of gasoline, aren't they? The former Shell CEO John Hoffmeister is on record as saying, in the face of sustained high oil prices, it's not an issue for large companies of needing the subsidies to entice us into looking and for producing more oil. My point of view is that with high oil prices, such subsidies are unnecessary. Now, this is the CEO of Shell. He's admitting on the record that these subsidies are unnecessary. At the time that the Shell CEO said that, the price of oil was trading between $95 and $98 a barrel. Currently, it's at $105 a barrel. Contrary to the claims that some are making, eliminating these subsidies will not raise gas prices. Last year, the company spent $70 million to lobby to keep their subsidies. That's about a, they get a, about $30 in tax breaks for every dollar they spend lobbying. No wonder they spend that much money on lobbying. You know, I want to take people at their word. And I want to take people seriously about debt reduction. I have co-sponsored spending caps with my Republican colleagues. I have worked hard on reforming the way we spend money around here, whether it's contracting or earmarks. But with all due respect, I don't know how the American people can take anyone seriously about debt reduction if they are not willing to cut off from the spigot the most wealthy, profitable corporations in the history of the world. How will we ever be able to look our grandchildren in the eye and say, you know, we really took care of your future by making sure that our government was fiscally balanced. How can we ever do that if we can't do this as an easy first step? Can you imagine how paralyzed this place will be when we start talking about the kinds of cuts that hurt people that need them? And by the way, they're willing to make those. Talk about fairness. Think about this for a minute. Economic fairness. The Ryan budget would want to hold on to more tax breaks for multimillionaires. In fact, do more tax breaks for multimillionaires. While they say to seniors, you know, it's 
we think it's time for you to wrestle with insurance companies for your health care. I know what it's like to wrestle with insurance companies for health care. Every American does. My mom doesn't have to. She's on Medicare. Gives her peace of mind. So really, if you look at what our friends are proposing in terms of fairness, and you look at the vote we just had, in Missouri, we'd say that dog don't hunt. It just doesn't work. So I, I hope in good faith that my Republican colleagues will quit thinking that we need to continue to write checks to the wealthiest corporations in the history of the planet. I think Missourians, I'm gonna, when I fill up my gas tank over the next two weeks as I travel around Missouri, I'm going to stop people at the gas station and say, do you think that the royalties that ExxonMobil pays to another country should be deducted from what they owe us? Think about that. It's ludicrous in this financial environment we're in, in the United States government. There are real people hurting out there, and we need to treat them fairly. And we can start by pushing big oil away from the taxpayer trough. And I hope my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will reconsider and that we'll get a chance to vote on this again and they can show the American people that we all get it. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Madam President. Madam President. The Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you, Madam President. I rise today to talk about the changes that the Affordable Care Act is making to the way that care is delivered in our health care system. This is a topic that has not received much public attention. Instead, the public debate has largely focused on contentious flashpoints like the individual mandate or preposterous false claims about death panels or rationing or socialized medicine. While these contentious debates have raged on, there has been a quiet, steady, and important effort made by the healthcare industry, by state and local leaders, and by the Obama administration to improve our model of healthcare delivery. Progress made on these efforts is steadily transforming the care that is delivered under our health care system from care that is disorganized and fragmented and often riddled with error to care that is coordinated, efficient, and the high quality care that Americans deserve. And by improving the quality of care and our health outcomes, these reforms, these delivery system reforms, promise to significantly reduce health care costs. Care gets better costs go down, a true win-win. I came to the floor today to release a report on health care delivery system reform and on the administration's progress implementing these provisions of the Affordable Care Act. I undertook this project with the support and assistance of Chairman Harkin and Senator Mikulski, both strong advocates and experienced legislators on the types of reforms that are highlighted in the report. The report makes the case for the reforms our country urgently needs in order to tackle our health care cost problem. My report defines five priority areas of health care delivery system reform. Payment reform, quality improvement, primary and preventive care, administrative cost, and health information infrastructure. And it outlines the potential cost savings in each area. It also highlights successes across the country from leading private health providers such as Geisinger Health Systems in Pennsylvania, Intermountain Healthcare in Utah, and the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin to the state of Vermont's blueprint for health to several examples in my home state of Rhode Island, which has shown great leadership. We have much to learn from these efforts, and the Affordable Care Act gives us the tools to support this type of reform across the country. The problem is that our health care delivery system remains clumsy and wasteful. We spend more than 18 percent of America's gross domestic product on our health care system every year. 
To put that into context, the highest any other industrialized country spends is approximately 12 percent of gross domestic product on health care. 18 percent United States of America, least efficient other industrialized country in the world, 12 percent. Huge room for improvement. In a nutshell, we overspend and underachieve. The President's Council of Economic Advisers estimated that over $700 billion a year can be saved without compromising health outcomes. The Institutes of Medicine put the savings from these kind of reforms at $765 billion a year. The New England Health Care Institute projected $850 billion in savings annually, and the Lewin Group and former Bush Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill have estimated the savings at a trillion dollars a year. Whichever is accurate, this is clearly an enormous opportunity, and it's right before us. We can achieve better results for American patients and families and spend less to do it. As I said, the solutions fall into five priority areas. Payment reform, primary and preventive care, measuring and reporting quality, administrative simplification, and health information infrastructure. These solutions do not cut benefits. They do not increase premiums. Instead, they realign incentives to reduce or get rid of overpriced or unnecessary services, inefficiently delivered care, excessive administrative cost, and missed prevention opportunities. In this report, we outline actual savings and care improvements that can be found in each priority area. For example, payment reform refers to the new payment reform models that pay doctors more for getting better results as opposed to for ordering more procedures. In 2010, Blue Shield of California collaborated with Hill Physicians Medical Group and Catholic Healthcare West, California's largest hospital chain, on a pilot program for the California Public Employees Retirement System. The pilot program focused on improved coordination of care by sharing clinical and case management information across medical facilities and among physicians. In its first year, the Blue Shield pilot program reported impressive results. Readmissions were reduced by 15 percent. Hospital days were reduced by 15 percent. Inpatient stays of 20 or more days were reduced by 50 percent, cut in half, all saving millions of dollars. In primary and preventive care, well, as a country, we don't devote nearly enough resources to primary care and prevention. Only 6 percent to 8 percent of health care spending goes to primary care, to your regular doctor appointments. That is less than the percentage that goes in private insurance to insurance company overhead. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, to give an example, when colorectal cancer is found early and treated, the five-year survival rate is 90 percent. But screening rates for colorectal cancer are low. The National Health Interview Survey found that in 2005, only half the population aged 50 and older received recommended screening for colon cancer. The American Cancer Society has found that increased colorectal screening in the pre-Medicare population could save lives and reduce subsequent Medicare treatment costs by $15 billion over 11 years. On measuring and reporting quality, we don't do this anywhere near well enough. Nearly one in every 20 hospitalized patients in the United States gets a hospital-acquired infection. This is very expensive, and it is preventable. A hospital-acquired infection should be a never event. Yet, they cost our health care system approximately $2.5 billion a year in harmful costs we could avoid. Administrative simplification. The proportion of the U.S. health care dollar that is lost to administration has always been high relative to our peer countries. 
And the cost of administration by insurance companies is not only high itself, but it creates a shadow cost imposed on providers who have to fight back against the insurance company claims denial apparatus, and that cost is probably even higher. A study published in Health Affairs documented that physicians spent on average 142 hours annually interacting with health plans, totaling nearly 7% of total health care costs. And that's just the physician's time. That doesn't count all the non-physician office staff dedicated to administration and chasing the insurance companies. Last, health inf information technology. Health information technology is the essential underlying framework for health care delivery system reform. It is the foundation on which other deli delivery system reforms can be built. In 2000, the Institute of Medicine estimated the number of deaths resulting from medical error as high as 98,000 American deaths annually. The most common cause of those preventable injuries and deaths in hospitals was medication errors, which can be reduced dramatically through the adoption of computerized physician order entry systems, health information technology. The five reform areas my report discusses synchronize with one another. And there is a growing national movement of providers and payers and states who recognize their critical importance. Focusing on quality rather than quantity, focusing on efficiency rather than volume, will better serve not only their patients, but their bottom line. The report I'm releasing today looks at 45 provisions in the Affordable Care Act that promote these delivery system reforms. From the discussion, you wouldn't know that virtually a third of the Affordable Care Act was about these delivery system reforms because they've been non-controversial. But they're in there, and they're important. The report also assesses the administration's progress in implementing them. We found that the administration has already implemented 25 provisions fully and made significant progress on two others. The complexity and sheer number of reforms included in the law make this accomplishment in a relatively short period of time noteworthy. And in addition to the hurdles presented by our fragmented health care system, there has been resistance in Congress to the administration's implementation efforts that has also created barriers. For the 20 delivery system provisions that have not yet been implemented, lack of congressional funding is a significant factor in delaying their forward progress. In these reform provisions, the Affordable Care Act is supporting and building upon the efforts undertaken by the private sector by realigning incentives in the health care system to support private sector efforts. A broad array of pilot and demonstration programs have been launched from which best practices will be deployed nationwide. The process to get to a more sustainable path will be one of, as CBO Director Elmendorf said, experimentation and learning. It will be a process of innovation. The Affordable Care Act improves the conditions that allow that innovation to take place. And it has the mechanisms needed to propagate those reforms widely throughout the system as quickly as possible once they're proven effective. American ingenuity can overcome our toughest challenges, not through command and control, but through dynamic, flexible, and persistent experimentation, learning, and innovation. We are at a fork in the road on our health care future. One path we could travel is to protect the dysfunctional status quo and cut benefits to pay for the waste. That's the way a lot of my colleagues want to go. The other way is to shift incentives so that we innovate towards better, safer health care, which costs less. We need to trust as Americans that the path of innovation and experimentation is the right one and not give up on these efforts. Last year, George Halvorsen, who is the CEO of Kaiser Permanente and knows a little something about health care, said it this way. I quote him. There are people right now who want to cut benefits and ration care and have that be the avenue to cost reduction in this country, and that's wrong, he said. It's so wrong, it's almost criminal. He continued, it's an inept way of thinking about health care. The Affordable Care Act has the tools that enable 
providers to focus on quality rather than quantity, efficiency rather than volume, and patience rather than their bottom line, to avoid the inept way of thinking about health care. As I close, let me say that throughout the process of writing this report, I found one thing to be glaringly absent, and that is a cost savings goal set by the administration for us to be reaching towards on these delivery system reform provisions. In 1961, President Kennedy declared that within 10 years, the United States would put a man on the moon and return him safely. This message was clear, it was direct, and it created accountability. As a result, a vast mobilization of private and public resources occurred to collaborate in innovative ways to achieve the President's purpose. While the issue facing our country in health care is different, the urgency and the need to mobilize the public and private sectors toward improving quality and reducing cost is the same. So I challenge the administration to set a cost savings target for delivery system reform. A cost savings target will focus, guide, and spur the administration's efforts in a manner that vague intentions to bend the health care cost curve will never do. It also would provide a, measure, a measurable goal by which we can evaluate our progress. A clear and public goal will help make this vision of our health care system a reality. It will drive forward progress and it will generate momentum to achieve that goal. So I urge the administration, set a goal that you are prepared to be accountable to meet. When President Kennedy announced in September of 1962 that America would strive to put a man on the moon, he said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade not because it is easy, but because it is hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. We need to face the challenge posed by the rising health care costs in our system. We need to recognize that we cannot postpone finding a solution. We can win this challenge. We can drive our system toward a sustainable path of higher quality care and improved outcomes. And we can do so by setting clear goals and supporting the measures in the Affordable Care Act that propel us in that direction. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield the floor. Madam Chair. The Senator from Illinois. I have 10 unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session. In the Senate, they have the approval of the Senate Majority and Minority Leaders, and I ask consent these requests be agreed to and be printed in the record. Without objection. Madam President, I want to sp speak for a moment to the issue that was raised by my colleague from Missouri. Senator Claire McCaskill came to the floor to take note of the vote that just finished, the roll call that just finished. It was on a measure offered by Senator Menendez of New Jersey. Pretty straightforward. Here's what it said. The federal tax subsidies to the biggest oil companies in America of $4 billion a year should end right now. The money in those subsidies should be used to develop other forms of energy, good for our future, clean for our environment, lessening our dependence on foreign oil, and the balance should be put into reduction of our deficit. $4 billion a year going to the five biggest oil companies in America. How are they doing? We all know how they're doing. Last year, again, they broke all records in the history of American business, reporting profits of $137 billion. The notion here that we would take away $4 billion from these oil companies and put it into deficit reduction and energy research that could be good for our future seems like a given. In fact, it seems so easy that when we had a vote earlier this week to bring this measure up, over 90 senators voted yes, let's go to it. What happened on this vote today? We needed 60 votes, which sadly has become the norm in this chamber. We needed 60 out of 100 senators to say, stop the fat cat subsidies to the oil companies. Couldn't get it. Got exactly one Republican senator to vote with us, one. 
It's a sad reality here that many of the same senators who wax eloquent on the floor about our deficit and what to do about it when it comes to a simple, straightforward vote to stop this wasteful, unwarranted subsidy to the most profitable companies on earth couldn't bring themselves to say no to big oil. Meanwhile, families and businesses all across Chicago, Illinois, and America are paying more and more at the pump. Last Sunday I saw my first one. Hang on, America, you're going to see one too. $5.03 a gallon. It's downtown Chicago at a BP station. Hang on tight, there's more to come from these oil companies who will then turn around and report the biggest profits ever in American business history. So we pay at the pump and we pay with our taxes what's left. Here was our chance to stand up and do something. Four billion, four billion isn't going to change the oil industry and it isn't going to change Washington, but at least it was a statement about where we stand when it comes to age-old, indefensible tax subsidies to the biggest companies, most profitable companies in America. Couldn't bring ourselves to do it. Couldn't do it. I agree with Senator McCaskill. These folks who get up here and wail and cry about the deficit, call this roll call up. Ask them, where in the heck were you when we had one chance, one chance to do something positive? It's not the biggest disappointment of the week. There are two others that trumpet. I have to tell you, it is hard for me to believe that again we were unable to get a bipartisan group together to start the conversation about postal office reform in America. It is the most honored federal agency. When people are asked across America, what agency of government do you have the positive feeling about? It's the post office. Oh, they make jokes about it. We all do. But we know in our heart of hearts it's the best postal service in the world. We can still take an envelope and for less than 50 cents, put it in a box and be confident that in a matter of a couple days or three, it's going to be delivered in the lower 48. There aren't many countries on earth that can even get close to making that claim for less than 50 cents. It's so good that the so-called Package Express folks who were trying to make this a private sector undertaking, they used the post office. They used the post office because of the efficiency of their delivery for the last mile of delivery. So we have a problem. Fewer people are using first-class mail. They're using email, bill payer. Revenues are down. Postal employees uh, are down to around 600,000. Those who are retired are around 450,000. We need to bank money for retirees in the future. We're facing the need to make some hard choices about the Postal Service. The Postmaster General came to my office, it's about five months ago now. We sat down with Mr. Donahoe and said, before you make harsh decisions about postal service, closing post offices, reducing the mail deliveries and the like, before people's jobs are on the chopping block, or at least in question, give Congress a chance to at least come up with a better approach. Historically, that was a challenge Congress always accepted. Because we knew when it's something that big and important as a postal service, which is enshrined in our Constitution, it's our job. We're supposed to do that work. So I asked him to postpone, if he would, until May 15th, any closures of facilities so the House and the Senate could have a chance to act. And I've been waiting. It's been hard to get into the Senate calendar. This week was our chance. Senator Harry Reid said, we're going to bring it up because it's an important debate. We need to get together. And we called the bill on the floor to move to this debate on the post office. To their credit, the Democratic, independent Democratic chairman of the jurisdictional committee, Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut, and the Republican ranking member, Senator Susan Collins of Maine, both voted to move to this measure. I felt good about the fact that they were working together, along with Tom Carper of Delaware and other word, others, in a bipartisan effort to make this post office what we need it to be. I have confidence in Senators Lieberman and Collins because they've done some historic work in the past. When it came to reforming our intelligence agencies after 9-11, the two of them did it. And I credit them many times publicly for their bipartisan cooperation. Here we had another chance. We we're going to bring Postal Service reform to the bill, to the floor. 
and we failed to get 60 votes. Unfortunately, could not bring more than five from the other side of the aisle to even engage in the debate on postal service reform. Now we're going to be gone for two weeks. When we return, it'll be a lot closer to May 15th and a lot more challenging for us to get anything done. Those two disappointments that we couldn't seize $4 billion in savings on the deficit in oil company subsidies, that we wouldn't accept our responsibility to deal with postal service reform, I'm afraid it's been matched and trumped by what's going on in the House of Representatives. Think about this. Two weeks ago, we passed a bill on the floor of the Senate, a bipartisan bill for the federal transportation bill. When it comes to our economy and its future, it's hard to think of anything more important than investing in highways, mass transit, airports and ports, rail lines to make sure that we have an economy ready to compete in the 21st century, that businesses can locate in America with the confidence their products can move to the markets as quickly as possible. This bill comes up every five years and it is a political piece of cake. Democrats and Republicans agree. We all have needs in our states and districts and we always come together with a bipartisan bill. We did in the Senate. Two senators on the political spectrum couldn't be further apart than Barbara Boxer of California and Jim Inhofe of Oklahoma. But you know what? They accepted their political responsibility, came up with a bipartisan bill, 74 to 22 had passed the Senate. Bipartisan federal transportation bill. Meanwhile, what was happening in the House? The House was just one crash after another. Their first highway bill went nowhere, rejected. Their second highway bill, they wouldn't even call for a vote. Time passed and more and more of these measures were falling apart. They withdrew the chairman of the committee in the House in charge of it, said we're going to put somebody else in, brought in another name. I couldn't keep up with it. The Speaker of the House and the House Republican Caucus made a dog's breakfast out of this federal transportation bill. And now today, to add insult to injury, they not only wouldn't call our bipartisan bill, that's all we've asked for. I see Senator Boxer on the floor here. All we've said is bring the Boxer Inhofe bill to a vote in the House. It's a bipartisan bill. It's good for this country. For goodness sakes, vote on it. Nope, we're not going to do it. If it isn't the House Republican bill, we're not going to consider it. What did they do instead? Senator Boxer can explain to you what they did instead. They said, we're just going to kick the can down the road. We'll extend the highway taxes for 90 days. We'll get back to you later. Well, you think, well, no harm, no foul. Just extending it 90 days, no harm. Wrong. State after state, county after county will tell you that this 90-day extension freezes efforts to build projects across America and will cost us at least 100,000 jobs. The number may be much larger but at least 100,000 jobs. Do we need jobs at this moment in time in America? I should say so. In the midst of a recovery from a recession, one of the areas hit the hardest is the construction industry. And it isn't just a matter of the workers out there on the job. It's all their suppliers, the truckers and truck drivers and material men and all of them are now going to be put on hold because the Speaker of the House refuses to call a bipartisan Senate transportation bill for a vote. That's all we asked. Up or down, call it for a vote. You know why he won't call it, Madam President? Because it would pass. It would pass to his embarrassment. Well, he got his way, I guess. He's going to send us a 90-day extension. The alternative of letting the Highway Trust Fund lapse is not a reasonable one, not one any of us would embrace. But what a wasted opportunity. My colleague sitting right here, my good friend, we've been in this business, House and Senate for a long, long time, poured her heart and soul into that federal transportation bill. She accomplished what nobody thought she could. When she said she was going to sit down with Senator Jim Inhofe of Oklahoma and work it out, we said, yeah, I'll bet that works. <laughs> Two of them are so different. But when it comes to this measure, they see eye to eye. They worked it out. I'm proud of what they did. I didn't like everything in the bill, but nobody does. But I voted for it saying it's bipartisan, it moves our country forward, and it creates almost three million jobs. The Boxer Inhofe bill creates almost, and saves, almost three million jobs. Important at this moment in our history? You bet it is. 
If you're not in favor of creating good paying jobs right here in America for American families, what the heck are you doing in this business? And instead, the House said, no, we will not even let you vote on this measure. House Democrats tried the entire week to get this measure up. Even a few, just a few, House Republicans spoke up and said, bring it up for a vote. It wasn't good enough. I know that Senator from California is here, and I want to give her a chance to say a word about the impact of the measure that just passed the House of Representatives. She has gone in it, in many cases, state by state, to measure what it means to just extend the Highway Trust Fund rather than to pass a bill that can create and save up to three million jobs. She told me in my state it was something like 4,000? More than that, about 4,500. 4,500 jobs lost right now. right now because Speaker Boehner refuses to call this bill. That's the reality. That's the reality. Is it any wonder that the approval rating of Congress is in single digits? When you take a hard look at what this does to our nation, at a time when we need Congress to work together, the Speaker won't call the bipartisan bill from the Senate. The Senate won't take up postal reform. The Senate refuses to even cut the $4 billion subsidy to the biggest oil companies in America. You know, it's a disappointment to me because many of us worked hard to come here. I feel honored to have this job and feel a responsibility to the people we represent. I think the Senate, on those two votes I mentioned, and the House with their action today, has let the people of this country down. I'd like to yield now to the Senator from California. I have another statement to make, but I want to give her a chance. I yield. Madam President, I, I ask the you The Senator now, from California. I ask you now to speak just about five minutes and then return the floor to Senator Durbin. Without objection. You know, I, I was going to wait till uh, the House actually sent over this extension before saying anything, but I, I was so uh, impressed with Senator Durbin's explanation that I felt I should come to the floor and thank him so much, his leadership on this, and also, Madam President, your concern, your deep concern for your state, which actually has the largest uh, job loss numbers because they're being very conservative about what they do on the ground. Because people don't understand, not everybody understands the way the transportation programs work in our states. The federal government pays for about 75 percent of many projects, the state 25 percent. But the states go out and they front the money, Madam President, and then they get, they bill the federal government. Well, the signal that has been sent from the House today is a disastrous signal because it is a signal to all of our states that they better beware because there's no guarantee they'll ever get those funds back from the federal government. You know, I love it when we make history here, but I love it when we make good history here. But today, by the House's action, I believe they become the first House of Representatives ever to allow this highway trust fund to go bankrupt. Because right now, the fund is not sufficient and has to be filled. That's why part of the uh, wonderful result of the Senate bill is that we had four committees working. I mean, I so appreciate getting a lot of credit. Senator Inhofe appreciates it as well. But we actually had four committees that did their work. Senators Johnson and Shelby over at Banking, and we had Senators Rockefeller and Hutchison over at Commerce, but very tough job was given to Senator Baucus, and he worked hand in glove with Republicans, particularly senators like Senator Thune, to come up with a pay for. Well, here we have an extension with no revenues in it, Madam President. So naturally, your state is very worried, and all of our states, and I'm going to quickly go through the, uh, what we know so far. We know that Illinois, uh, is having big trouble because their contract letting cannot go forward in 12 particular jobs, and that's going to result in a scale back of 4,500 jobs. Right now, they're scaling back right now, as Senator Durbin said, at a time when we need jobs. 
North Carolina, 41,000 jobs that cannot be filled. Nevada, 4,000 jobs. Maryland, 4,000. Michigan, 3,500. And I see the great senator from Rhode Island here. We got word from your director, Mike Lewis, uh, from the Rhode Island Department of Transportation that, um, that there are job delays and it looks like 1,000 jobs won't be filled. West Virginia, 1,200 jobs. We are, <laughs> we're in trouble. And you know what? It, it's like taking a hammer and hitting your head. Why do you do it? <laughs> you don't have to. They don't have to do this. They are wreaking havoc on the nation with this extension. And Chairman Micah said today, this must be the last extension. Fine. It shouldn't even be an extension. They should take up and pass the Senate bill. How many bills do we have that have 74 votes in favor? And if Senator Lautenberg hadn't been in a funeral, it would have been 75. Three quarters of this United States Senate have came together around this bill. So the House is wreaking havoc on the nation. Right now you could fill 14 Super Bowl stadiums with unemployed construction workers, 1.4 million. And why are they doing it? Because they don't want to deal in any way with the Democrats. Senator Inhofe and I were so thrilled to work together. I see the senior senator from Alaska who helped us draft our bill, helped us with Senator Begich. They crossed party lines. We have a great bill. Is it perfect? Of course not. Is it strong? Yes. Is it paid for? Yes. Will it protect 1.9 million jobs and create an additional million? Yes. That's great news. But the House, you know, has decided the only people in America not to get this is the House of Representatives over there, the Republicans. And I see my colleague here, and I'm, I'm glad to yield to him. I wonder if the senator would yield yes. for a question. Yes. Uh, my question the is, senator from Rhode Island. setting aside the questions that this raises about the House's ability to govern, which I think are raised by this issue, but focusing right down on this highway question, it's now the end of March. If we go 90 days, 30 days takes us through the end of April. 30 more days takes us through the end of May. 30 more days takes us through the end of June. There is a seasonal component to getting this work done, yes. is there not? What is the effect of this entire industry, our entire highway, road, and bridge industry, having no certainty about what their funding is going to be right. until practically the 4th of July with the construction season then underway? Well, the question is very important. This is the worst possible time because now if you can't enter into new contracts, you lose the building season. And it is particularly brutal right now on the businesses and on the workers. And my friend is exactly right. It is terrible timing. And let me just be clear here. This the senator's concern. I'd ask for additional minutes. one minute. Without objection. Let me be clear here. This is a 90-day extension, I say to my colleagues, without any hopes of them finishing their work. They didn't say in the 90 days they'd get the job done, get to conference, and get the bill to the president. They're just saying 90 days with no commitment to go to conference. So I'm going to come back here. We're going to attempt to attach the Senate bill to the uh, extension. And Madam President, I hope you'll have the opportunity to work on that with me because our states are counting on us and we have to be strong and we have to keep fighting for one simple premise, that the House should have the right to vote on the Senate pass bill. I'm very proud to be here. I will be here this afternoon as long as it takes. We're going to try to attach the, I say to my friend from Rhode Island, I hope he can be there, my friend from Illinois. As soon as we get the, uh, their extension, which makes no commitment to go to conference, we're going to try to attach the Senate bill to the extension and send it into conference. And I hope my friends will be here to help me with that. I would yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Illinois. I see my friend and colleague from Alaska is on the floor, and I would like to yield to her and ask consent that I be recognized after her statement.